Hello and welcome to OWASP and CSA IoT, Impacting Medical Security. My name is Aaron Guzman. I am the Product Security Lead at Cisco Meraki, in charge of all things hardware, firmware, and IoT security. I also lead the OWASP IoT project along with subprojects co-chair for the Cloud Security Alliance IoT Working Group. I've co-authored the IoT Penetration Testing Cookbook. I'm a tech technical reviewer with Packet Publishing and No Starch Press. Practical IoT Hacking is the latest publication released in March of this year, 2021, although right on its heels is Bug Bounty Bootcamp, which is soon to be released in the coming months. In practical IoT hacking, you will find some medical device oriented uh, attack techniques for network protocols such as DICOM. So make sure to check them out. I will promise you, you will learn a thing or two. So really happy to be here, you know, presenting on, you know, OWASP and Cloud Security Alliance. I will first you know, talk about some of the, the hats that I wear, right? Multiple, depending on the day. And uh, we'll get started with OWASP for those who don't know. Uh, for those who have, who are familiar, uh, you may have come across OWASP if you are trying to remediate a software security vulnerability. But for those who do not know, uh, uh, OWASP is a, an acronym for Open Web Application Security Project. OWASP is a nonprofit started in uh, started up in 2001, and it's actually the 20th anniversary this year. So it's a big milestone. OWASP has great, uh, very smart uh, experts from all paths around the world. There are reg regional and global events, and what I mean by events uh, is conferences and hackathons. Um, so there's global apps like USA's. Europe, APAC, uh, Latin America, but also regional and, and states, you know, uh, chapters, right? Like AppSet California is one that is near and dear to my heart and, and one that I help organize, you know, pre-pandemic at this point. Uh, but essentially OWASP is an authoritative source for software security. So if you get a chance, check out the OWASP flagship projects won't be a waste of time. You might be surprised and find a thing or two that you didn't know before, whether it's a piece of knowledge or a tool or guidance. So I'm here to talk about the OWASP IoT project, Internet of Things. This project was founded in 2014 and designed to help manufacturers, developers, and consumers better understand IoT security issues. And now the idea was to kind of cast the net wide and, and apply our knowledge and education, you know, to as many as many paths and, and areas and audiences. Um, so th that's the way we, we've kind of approached uh, some of our projects with, uh, with projects or tools and guidance and best practices. And when you think about medical device security, right? Uh, medical device security, you know, the, the platforms that they run on, it could be embedded Linux, it could be uh, Windows, it could be bare metal, meaning, you know, my, uh, microcontrollers without operating systems. And software is controlling, right, is the crux of, of controlling that, the functionality of those devices. And uh, what the IoT project is, is, you know, some of the projects that we, we work on is, you know, to help the, you know, the security and the awareness aspects of of, of uh, you know, developing and deploying, right, and building. So we've been cited in, in numerous publications and information security standards. The most recent one that I've stumbled upon was the FTC had uh, cited us for uh, building security into Internet of Things in 2021. To to our surprise, which is which is awesome. Um, we collaborate with alike organizations, whether that's Anisa. Cloud Security Alliance, uh, you know, other other companies, you know, around the world, uh, you know, we're looking to collaborate more, GSMA, other folks in the space, uh, especially in, in the medical, right? 
Um, we'll talk about you know some of the the, the work in, in the medical space, obviously. So the project we've we've broken it up in, into a couple of different categories, uh, namely seek and understand that we'll talk about today, and uh, we'll also talk about the the validation. And so seek and understand. Uh, we have a couple couple projects that we'll we'll talk through today: the uh, top ten, the IoT top ten, and IoT Goat. And to make the IoT top 10 kind of more applicable for some groups, so we created a mapping project and, and mapped them to a number of sister projects in the industry. IoT top 10, this is essentially our flagship project. It's meant to uh, you know, create the, the awareness and supposed to be, you know, top 10 things to avoid when building, deploying, and managing IoT systems. And when we develop this list, uh, you know, we, we have a methodology to which we use and, uh, you know, we gather data from different sources, right? And we look at sister projects. And, and the, the theme was simplicity. Again, casting that net wide to, you know, manufacturers, consumers, and the enterprise as well, who are, who are using these devices in their network. And we wanted to, to highlight essentially what are the highest priority issues you should be aware of. Now, the list isn't necessarily ranked from the most uh, critical to the least critical. Um, although from the prevalence, you, you'll notice, um, you, know, the, you know, ranging from one, how, how common and pervasive some of these issues are and the impact that uh, attackers can can gain uh, and 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 you know once exploit once exploited into an environment and when talking about medical that gain could be someone's life right. IoT goat. What is IoT goat? IoT goat is a, del a deliberately vulnerable firmware, and what we did is we based it off of OpenWRT, and OpenWRT is a, is an build system. And what build system is, it makes it easy, easier essentially to, to compile and build firmware. And it does that in a way, right, that's, that's open source and, and which is why we chose OpenWRT. Uh, the other reason why we cho chose OpenWRT is it, it's uh, compatibility with old devices that you may have, uh, let's say laying around old routers or old networking equipment or you know devices that are compatible with OpenWRT and give you that flexibility to flash IoT Goat and to practice finding and identifying and exploiting vulnerabilities within firmware. So when we developed IoT Goat, we incorporated as much as we could of the IoT top 10. And when I say as much as we could, I mean, Everything aside from the hardware and and, uh, and kind of process base. Well, actually, everything aside from the hardware, and that's that's actually in our roadmap as well. And so, we, what we wanted to do is is use this vulnerable firmware as a as a learning platform for professionals, researchers, software developers, anyone who is looking to get into firmware hacking, IoT hacking, and and give them that playground to let loose and to practice and to level up and gain that confidence. If you've ever gotten started into IoT hacking, I'm sorry, uh, firmware hacking, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a tall, it's a tall order, right? Uh, if you have no previous exposure or visibility. And so again, this is meant as, as, as a platform to help enable folks, uh, you know, get more confident and, and, and familiar with uh, the types of vulnerabilities that are within uh, firmware. So I'll show a few screenshots. Here's the, the login page. By the way, this is, uh, IoT Goat is up on, on GitHub. If you want to have a play, you're more than welcome to. Here is the secret developer diagnostics page. You'll find these somewhat common or uncommon, maybe left over from debug code uh, for from devices. Uh, usually, right, uh, it is not a good sign when you find these types of diagnostic pages that allow access, uh, you know, by other means that you know elevated access. 
So we've developed challenges to, to walk you through how to find the vulnerabilities. And a part of a roadmap is how to fix the vulnerabilities as well. And what you see here on your screen is the back door for IoT Goat, essentially a, a service that is running on startup. And you can connect to that particular service and uh, get root access and practice post exploitation if you'd like, meaning going from device to device inside of a network or keeping it simple. Um, simple is always the best, right? Especially when you're getting started. This screenshot here is the listening network services from Nmap. And you'll see you know, the common HTTP, UP, UPnP, as well as a couple of services that run on high ports that are unknown which might be fruitful if you poke at them and you find out what they're running. Who knows? You may get access to a device. You may exploit a vulnerability. So good luck. Have a play. Again, I IoT Code is, is there, for, is there uh, as a resource for you all. And we'll talk a little bit more of you know, what, what you can use in conjunction with IoT Code next. So our other category is validate and test. Talked about seek and understand, and this is validate and test. And in validate and test, we have the IoT security verification standard, firmware security testing methodology, and byte sweep, which is a tool, a firmware analysis tool. Firmware security testing methodology was meant to lower the barrier of entry for I IoT hacking, including medical devices, right? So this is this could be used hand in hand with IoT Goat. And, and the idea is to enable more uh, professionals or more, more folks who are interested in getting into firmware hacking and providing those guide rails um, and providing the guidance and kind of a systematic you know, in a systematic way, all in, you know, one resource. And if you're like me, uh, you know, you'll, you, when you get started in firmware, you'll be like, ah, there's so much going on. I don't know where to start. This is, this, this might be for you. Uh, and like any other methodology, right, you can jump from step to step. And what we've done is we broke it down into nine steps, right? And the nine steps, again, depending on your, your scope and your expertise, and, and the foothold you may already have, you know, you can jump around as, as mentioned. We've went ahead and provided uh, tool usage examples, uh, walkthroughs, right? Again, to be able to, to, sh to, to help and, and, and show and, and teach uh, essentially, you know, the common techniques, the common tools. Um, and and what we've done is create a companion uh, virtual machine with preloaded tools vulnerable firmware such as, you know, IoT Go, but also a few others um, that the industry has provided, and even some that have known vulnerabilities for, for products and, and manufacturers out there, uh, you know, zipped up and, you know, trying to keep the space minimal. So again, really trying to, trying to enable more folks uh, to get going and, and, and get some help with, with firmware hacking and start poking around into you know IoT devices, medical devices, right? IoT security verification standard, ISVS. So ISVS, what it consists of is is three verification levels, and we have five chapters, or if you want to call them domains with a total of 138 controls. Now, don't pay attention to the controls so much, uh, but the, the, the aim of the project is to create a basis uh, for, for testing IoT applications, software, and, and their, their technical controls, but also to develop contextual requirements uh, for secure development and design. So you can use it as, as part of the hardware design for medical devices. You can use it as a set of product security requirements to be included 
into product requirement documents, PRDs, if you're a manufacturer. Uh, if you're buying devices, you can use them for procurement of medical devices, uh, developing medical device security training, uh, assess the security posture of a medical device, and provides a basis, right, to define verification levels based off of the, the medical device's risk. You know, today there isn't, uh, you know, a, a standard to help normalize you know, the coverage of how well my IoT device, my medical device has been has been tested. It's essentially, you know, tribal knowledge, or maybe there's a, a an overview of a methodology. Uh, but this 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 aims to plug those gaps and, and help clear the, the ambiguity there. And so we, we followed uh, our, our sister sister projects within OWASP. The ASVS is for the web, the MASVS for mobile and the SCVS or software composition. I'll think about it like supply chain and building, building uh, software. So this project is still, I'm sorry, <laughs> is in release candidate stage. It's been a rough year, <laughs> but we are hoping to get it out fairly soon for you all and we're just tidying things up. So we are open to additional uh, feedback and, and contributors, and we'll we'll get to how you can reach us later on. Some honorable mentions that that affect the you know medical device security, the embedded application security best practice, best practices uh, were previously released around 2016 timeframe, and uh, we are doing a refresh with newer uh, newer techniques, newer guidance. Uh, different formatting. Uh, right now we have a base set of seven that you see on the screen here with sensitive data management down at cryptography. Initially we had 10. Uh, and again, this is still a work in progress, right? And and, and if you notice Yocto and OpenWRT, these are these are very popular uh, embedded build systems for, for devices. So likely, you know, your medical device that you that you purchase, uh, if it has a Linux operating system is built with one of these one of these build systems here. And the hardware security testing methodology is something that is that is a work in progress. And again, you know, kind of taking that 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 step even even lower from firmware or actually stage lower, right? Uh, where you, you have the hardware uh, and uh, let's say you need to pull the firmware and to find vulnerabilities and then exploit them. This hardware methodology, testing methodology, uh, will help you in that endeavor when you're embarking on those types of assessments, those hardware analysis, the tools you'll need to have in your toolkit, uh, the, the techniques you'll have to keep in mind, when to try which technique. And again, it's it's for those for those folks who, again, need that, that guide rail, a little bit of a kickstart or something to you know kind of keep you honest and, and reference as like hey you know um, I am ensuring I'm, I'm covering these certain areas for these vulnerable hardware debug interfaces these uh, these UARTs these serial interfaces these JTAGs uh, how do I connect to these uh, what do I do afterwards how do I gain root access and gain persistence so we hope to, you know these resources will be helpful to you all. But you might be asking, this is OWASP. These are OWASP projects. Why is OWASP involved in IoT and in hardware and in embedded? Well, at the end of the day, everything is software, right? Without software, hardware would not be able to function. Firmware would not be able to talk to the hardware, the drivers, right? Wireless protocols, all software zeros and ones, right? <laughs> if you want to take it down even to the, its lowest. Switching hats now to my Cloud Security Alliance hat. Brief intro about Cloud Security Alliance. It's a global organization with a similar structure than OWASP. Free to join and participate. Resources, best practices and, and events as well. Uh, I guess the, the large, the larger differentiator would be 
the cloud security certifications that they offer. And OWASP is, is, does not offer such certifications. They are 5013C. Both great groups. I give 100% of credit to, to both of these organizations and where I'm at. Uh, without uh, either of these organizations, I would have not had opportunities to edit books and write a book. Um, so keep that in mind as, as you're pondering whether I should get involved throughout this presentation. So the Cloud Security Alliance IoT Working Group. I've been a part of this group uh, since, since the beginning, and it was originally part of the mobile working group in 2014 uh, when, we spun, when we spun off. Uh, we've also you know, worked with, with industry, regulatory, and corporate and corporates as well, you know, from, from the collaboration perspective. And uh, we've been lucky enough to be incited in, in RFCs and different standards as well. And you can see a couple of screenshots there with uh, one of our RFCs, RFC 8576. We've put out a number of different publications throughout the years, specific to industries, specific to the uh, to the enterprise, right? Um, and uh, you know, two two medical publications have been pub have, have been released, and we're working on a third, which we'll we'll talk to talk about today. Uh, so I guess you know, with the collaboration in mind, uh, you know, OWASP and Cloud Security Alliance worked together to release the Secure Medical Device Deployment Standard. If you may be wondering. So there's a lot of cross-pollination. Again, we're all saying the same thing and we should all be working together. So if you all are in similar groups and you want to collaborate, let's do it. Now the IoT controls matrix, this is the flagship project for our IoT working group. It is modeled after the cloud, the cloud control matrix, the CCM, there's 165 controls aimed at enterprise IoT that incorporate multiple layers of connected devices, cloud services, and networking technologies. So we have 21 domains, security domains, and that's ranging from asset management, like you have to know what you have to get started, uh, from governance, even legal, down to vulnerability management and security testing activities whether that is web application security testing, firmware, uh, bug bounties even included. So it, it's really holistic. So it should be a helpful resource for health, uh, healthware, uh, I'm sorry, healthcare delivery organizations and any organization deploying connected devices in their networks. So how we're evolving the IoT controls matrix is we want to glue the process, policy, infrastructure, ecosystem controls with the device itself. And, you know, a part of that is, you know, the industry is changing. We have, you know, zero trust, <laughs> zero touch provisioning, you know, supply chain issues are, you know, I don't want to say at its height, but it is, it is up there and it is on top of everyone's minds, especially in 2021 and the day on, in remote working now. Right, and people are sending these appliances and their networks and these IoT devices, and they're just connecting to corporate environments, and you know, managing and and you know the whole complexities that come with that. And so, for the next version, we're looking to not only evolve, evolve and refine our controls, but introduce a shared uh, responsibility matrix uh, tailored towards IoT, uh, and and again to kind of expand that applicability. We create mappings to. Uh, either sister projects, such as, you know, Anissa's IoT, you know, baseline, security baseline, and the, the various NIST standards out there. And of course, Cloud Security Alliance projects like CCM. As you may have noticed, securing IoT is not an easy task, right? Like medical device manufacturers must trust their supply chain partners and the supply chain partners must do their due diligence and that cascades down, right? Even further to the enterprise and consumers 
which they must trust the connected products that they meet you know, minimum, minimum standards and controls. And typically this trust is obtained through you know, a series of, of questionnaires and back and forth and interaction with, with each group or each party or, some, or, or a sort of trust portal that satisfies uh, procurement requirements. So when you're purchasing things, at the end of the day, right, given the complexity of, of IoT and the, the, the scope, right, there is not one size fits all. Solutions and controls must be inter interoperable, must provide automation to scale, and they have to be validated, right? There has to be, you know, internal and external validation to ensure these controls are, are working and that the lights flicker, you know, the alarms, the alarms are going off when they should be. So an ongoing project is, is zero trust for IoT. And this, this is really important for those medical devices that you may be plugging in and hey, now all of a sudden they are paired and they are working. They are onboarded with, you know, uh, again, zero, zero, tr zero trust or, or uh, touch, I guess you can say. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a methodology to the architecture in which you know we break it down from the onboarding, the authentication, the authorization, and then how you monitor those types of devices and, and the different policies you want to employ. And then you know if there is a root of trust, hardware root of trust, how do you leverage those for that kind of secure identity? Otherwise, you know if the identity could be tampered with, uh, so could that trust, right? Cloud Security Alliance Medical Device Incident Response Playbook. The goal of this project is to establish the best containment, eradication, and recovery practices for, for each category while minimizing the risk those practices have on patient care. So we've modeled this playbook after you know, the NIST SP861R2, but we, we created our own kind of differentiators here in the sense of, you know, we're defining incidents in this context as a vulnerability disclosure and one or more uh, CVEs affecting medical devices within a health healthcare delivery organization inventory, or the discovery of malware, ransomware, or loss of availability of a medical device. So this might sound all too common, you 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 may have heard all the vulnerabilities reported for medical devices in the past, or what about the novel uh, WannaCry a few years back, three four years back now, which took down a number of hospitals and was devastating for some and and cost cost lives. So this playbook is supposed to be used as a basis, as a starting point to incorporate into. A, a, an HDO, a healthcare delivery organization's program. And so we, we've defined these seven clinical scenarios. And these clinical scenarios range on, uh, based on the, the, uh, the types of devices that are being used. So for example, uh, number one would be, you know, if it's safe to connect from the patient and the network, is it safe to connect from, uh, to, uh, is it safe to disconnect from the network? Can the devices be shut down safely and removed from the patient? Is a disconnection possible, but with clinical impact? So we'll, we'll go through a couple of these, or I'll just show you the, the workflow that, uh, example workflows. Again, these will be contextualized or should be contextualized to internal processes. But what is always step one with an incident response, right? You can see, you can see the, uh, the list here, right? The, the five phases. The most important, one of the most important <laughs> is, is to prepare, right? And, and, and we've, helped, we've helped kind of shape, you know, high level activities that, that medical facilities can, can employ. You know, kind of expanding on, on some of these activities. You know, again, you have to know what you have. So starting with inventory, classify the clinical impacts, 
and the data impacts, what happens when you know, patients are affected, devices are affected, creating a, you know, a list of stakeholders, not only within the medical facility, their health delivery organization, but also with the device manufacturers and anyone else. But also, you know, backing up and, and monitoring, so on and so forth. Uh, so check out the playbook. We have some great details in there. So after preparing, right, you have to be able to detect, analyze, and contextualize. You know, and and within within this phase, you'll have to maintain a number of different initiatives and programs. What I mean by programs are your threat intelligence programs communication and relationships with information sharing and analysis centers, ISACs. Your vulnerability management program. How do you find vulnerabilities? How do you how do you remediate vulnerabilities internally and externally? Are you asking for software bill of materials for devices for devices to understand their software composition, what they're made out of, their central uh, essentially their nutritional facts? You get their versioning information and and compare them to a databases, CVE databases, so you can understand the risk that they're they're introducing into your network. Other considerations for programs are to maintain a catalog of, of IOCs, indicators of compromise. And having a SIM and monitoring for, for security events using that SIM. And incorporating a behavioral profiling mechanism and whether that is something that a vendor provides or something internally but it is it is it is needed right and this is this is part of detecting analyzing and contextualizing according to your organization contain eradicate and recover so the activities in in this phase of the ir process are dependent on a set of incident response classifications. So these, these response class, classifications take into account the clinical considerations associated with the usage of each device. And you'll, you'll understand what, what I'm saying in just a moment, right? So this is the, the scenarios I was mentioning. So safe to disconnect from the patient and network. So there are no patient safety issues with immediately removing the device from the patient or the network. An example could be a wireless uh, blood pressure cuff. Disconnection from the network possible, but with clinical impact. While the device can uh, uh, operate independently of the network, its disconnection will have clinical impact. A telemetry monitor, which is often used to constantly collect and monitor the vitals of patients in ICUs and other critical units is an example of this scenario. Shut down or disconnect from, from the patient with safety implications. So the medical devices is providing like clini uh, clinical necessary functions and the device is required to be online to perform its function. So an example of this could be a CT machine. All right, these are very real relatable, maybe you know, some, you know, you or someone in your family has interacted with these types of scenarios. Um, and, and one scenario that is near to me, and I didn't mention it here, is, you know, the implantable scenario. You know, what happens, you know, when a pacemaker, there's an incident there. Uh, and, and what do you do? And what do clinicians do? And, and, and how do they loop in the third parties, the, the manufacturers? And, and uh, how do you respond, right? So I found this, this image uh, quite funny. Cut a virus from your computer and we had to erase your brain. I hope you've got a backup copy. And the, in, in the age of ransomware and the wide you know, exploitation of ransomware and wearables and implantables, you're, you know, it is not possible to, to back up, right? In those cases, but you can back up your, your IT infrastructure and, and, and uh, you know, telehealth devices, or maybe not even telehealth devices, but other devices within a hospital network. The next phases 
are you know, analyze the post incident sharing and updating with stakeholders and stakeholders could also be the information sharing groups the isacs and then you're looping back around to prepare and incorporating the lessons learned into the playbook into your processes and uh, helping right with, with that sharing part you're helping others learn from what you learn so that they can incorporate into their programs as well so these isacs if you're not familiar they do have you know a sort of confidentiality agreement uh, which is which is beneficial, right? And in, in, in these cases, and and obviously, probably needed, right? Wrapping up, wanted to provide a, a table to to help illustrate medical device security activities and applicable projects we talked about today. So securely developing medical device software, you can take a look at the top 10, ISVS, embedded AppSec best practices, and zero trust for IoT. Identify medical device vulnerabilities, you can use IoT Goat as, as a playground and replicate that into a real device. The firmware security testing methodology, the hardware security testing methodology, Byte Sweep as the tool to help you with your firmware analysis. ISVS, right, to, to figure out which, which test cases I should be incorporating into my workflow, into my assessment. ISVS, uh, not, I think I may have skipped over this. It is written in a way that, uh, well, it is written in, in verify that. So every, every, uh, every control is verify that. Obviously verification levels, there's three of them. So when you're purchasing, deploying, managing, and maintaining connected medical devices, use the IoT controls framework, the secure medical device deployment standard. You can also use the medical device incident response playbook because there are some good bits in there from uh, the, the, uh, the kind of um, uh, managing and purchasing as well. From the preparing, detecting, containing, and post medical device security incidents, the medical device IR response playbook, right? Uh, the one that we just spoke about. How to get involved. Hopefully one of these excited you or you've you found uh, that, you know, there is room where there is a gap perhaps in, in, in some of the, the work that, that we've performed or you wanna be a fly on the wall and you wanna get involved and, and just listen in to learn. You were available on Slack for Cloud Security Alliance and OWASP. For OWASP to get access to Slack, go to OWASP.org and go to About, and there is a Slack section there. Just input your email, you'll get an invite. You can also reach out to project leaders, whether they're active project leaders or current project leaders like myself. I will help you. I will. I will uh, help you route. You know, your route it to the appropriate person if it's not me. Uh, we're pretty easy to get a hold of on on socials. You can see, uh, you know, <laughs> my Twitter at the bottom right hand corner. You know, LinkedIn as well. With Cloud Security Alliance, we do have a monthly meeting, again free to attend and join. And keep in mind with contributing and getting involved, it's technical and non technical opportunities. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a super hard work, you know, a super hacker or anything like that. User experience, design, format, reviewing, editing, those are all needed skills. So again, free and open to all who are inter interested. Here is my contact info if you wanna reach me directly. Thank you for your time. Have fun at Biohacking Village and DEF CON if you're there. Appreciate your time. Take care all.